You are listening to Salty Believer Unscripted, a production of SaltyBeliever.com. It is Salty Believer Unscripted once again. We are still talking about preaching, and we have a, a special guest. I'm Brian Catherman. With me is Jared Jenkins. Tell yep. us about our guest, Jared. So we have on the phone today, we're doing another phone interview because uh, the first one went so well, and it is my friend Travis Freeman who was a, a good friend of mine in seminary at Southern. He, and he uh, he was there with me as I was doing my MDiv. And while I was doing my MDiv, he was doing his Ph.D. In? Preaching. All right. So say hi, Travis. Welcome to the program. Hello. It's great to, uh, great to be with you all today. So, Travis, this the, I will start with kind of this. T- tell us a little bit about yourself and then kind of tell us, I mean, what is a what does a PhD in preaching entail? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, because you can actually get a PhD in preaching and never preach a sermon. Oh, uh, is that the it, case, it, Wait, Travis? Is that the case for you? Yes. Uh, no, but it, uh, <laughs> you know, I I did my master's at Southern. I uh, started it in O. Four, January of 04. I graduated there in 07 and decided I wanted to do PhD work and realized that there was no way I could do New Testament, Old Testament, systematics, or history, and that left me with preaching. Hmm. Uh, but I, I, love, I love preaching. I love the um, study of the art and craft of preaching. And... And yeah, a, a, a PhD in preaching is very theoretical. Uh, you study a lot of the process, a lot of the history of preaching, um, hermeneutics of preaching. Uh, you look at uh, there, there are doctrinal preaching. I have a seminar on doctrinal preaching. Uh, there are some, some uh, seminars on preaching different um, types of scripture, one on Pauline preaching. Um, and so it, it, it's looking at, at a lot of the different aspects of what makes a sermon a sermon, um, thinking through the process of preaching and how to teach preaching. So, Dr. Freeman, I'm still, <laughs> I'm still trying to get my head around uh, this one thing. So you're telling me someone could... Um, Get an get an MDiv, get a PhD in preaching, and then be teaching people to preach, having never really preached, no experience there. It, it's not something I would recommend, <laughs> but but yeah, it is theoretically possible. But uh, it it would be hard probably to get through Southern the master's level and not take a preaching class. Yeah, which would force you to preach. Yeah, but. If you came in from outside, I mean, there is the possibility you could take zero preaching classes in your undergrad, which or in your in your masters, which would require you to preach, and then come into the preaching program and in the actual preaching PhD, you don't preach, and and so it, it's all theoretical and and discussions about preaching and looking at historical preaching and, and so forth and so on, but you never you never actually have to preach for a class or anything like that in the PhD program. Now, now I know that's not the case with you, so uh, I've heard you preach on several occasions, and, and you, do, you do very well. You're a very good preacher. Um, tell us a little bit about kind of your, your ministry background. I mean, you've been preaching for a while. Um, I know you you preach now, so t- kind of tell us a little bit about what you do now in preaching. Uh, right now, um, I am an adjunct professor at the University of the Cumberlands in southeastern Kentucky, and uh, teaching, actually in the spring, I want to be teaching an undergrad course on preaching. Uh, right now, I'm teaching a master's course on preaching. Um, I, I do a lot of traveling and preaching, uh, pulpit supply. Uh, I have a, every Sunday afternoon I preach at uh, a county jail here in town. Uh, yeah, any, 
any any time somebody throws the door open and says come and preach, I'm I'm there ready to talk. Good. And and one other just quick thing I know about you, just because I just because I'm your friend, I, I kind of know where this is going to go. But give us just a really brief thing. What'd you What'd you write your dissertation on? I uh, wrote my dissertation on uh, Tim Keller's use of presuppositional apologetics to influence the uh, worldview development of his audience. Wow! So, uh, yeah, are you and Tim Keller friends now? No, <laughs> um, I actually met Keller at the Gospel Coalition in 2011 and uh, walked up to him and told him who I was, where I was from, I was writing my PhD, and uh, that I was writing my PhD, my dissertation on him. Yeah. Phone yeah, thing. sorry about the phone call. Uh, so let's let's jump into it a little bit. So Travis, you you hold a PhD in preaching. You you preached a lot. Um, what what would be your just your base definition of what preaching is? Now we're a little nervous to ask. You know, we're, a doctor on preaching. That's right. That's the definition <laughs> of preaching. But. Um, I would say that it is. Um, the the communication um, of the meaning of a biblical text um, to an audience, showing them how that text applies to their life, and how ultimately that text finds its culmination in the person and work of Jesus Christ. That's a pretty good definition. <laughs> that's, a, that's a very good definition. <laughs> Which I'm breathing a sigh of relief because we've it seems it's seemingly everybody we've interviewed so far has come to a pretty similar definition, kind of including uh, exposition of the word at some in some for, you know in some sort of phrasing and some application. However, you added uh, the kind of the revealing of the person of Christ, which I think is a really that's a good addition. That's a good addition. Yeah, yeah. That's a really well, good I, I think that um, especially in the Old Testament, but even in the New Testament, we can um, run a a had a tendency as preachers to be very um, moralistic. Hmm. Um, in our preaching, we, we, we will preach, you can preach a sermon from the gospel about Christ and be moralistic. And totally uh, miss Jesus. Yeah, and totally miss Jesus. You can preach about Jesus and totally miss Jesus. Hmm. And I always like to say, if you're preaching an Old Testament sermon that a Jew could sit there and listen to and agree with every word that you said, then you're not preaching the gospel. That's you're good. preaching moralism. Yeah, that, that's and, a pretty good indictment. <laughs> yeah, and so I, I love, you know, one, one of the things that I always try to do is I try to form a, a tension in the sermon um, so that I want people to feel the weight of the text and the weight of what the text demands of them and the reality that they cannot meet that demand. Hmm. Oh, wow. And then lose that tension with the gospel. Uh, so I, I preach, um, I've got a sermon that I, I love to preach on First Timothy 3, um, the qualifications of an over- overseer. And, and I'll lay the qualifications out and, and, you know, some, some heavy qualifications there. And then I'll say something to the effect of, and the reality is no one is qualified to be a pastor. 
Yep, we would agree. <laughs> which then I would be like, Jesus, yeah. right? Which then we all go into a depressed state of whoa, right? Yeah, yeah, and 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 kind of build that tension of oh, oh crap! If no one's qualified to be a preacher, then what in the world are we doing? <laughs> yeah. And then and then point people to the reality that there was one who was qualified, and that was Christ, and that we should um, be striving and keep our focus on a bloody cross and an empty tomb. And as we do that, then Christ will continue to form us and conform us into the preacher and the pastor that he wants us to be. Um, and so there's the, there's the weight of the law, the weight of the command there. Uh, you can't ignore that. You've got to hold that. But then you also have to hold up the gospel and Christ and say, you know, here's what you've got to do, but you can't do that. But here's one who did do that, and so focus on him and live for him. I think I just got saved again, Travis. <laughs> <laughs> Is there an altar call coming? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe there should be. <laughs> there should be. So, so, Travis, I'm curious what your what your rhythm of preaching looks like, your routine of preparation. Kind of, let's maybe talk about yeah. that a little bit. Yeah. So, what uh, is, so well, if you're if you're going to preach on a Sunday, what is what is your week or your month or your two weeks? You know, what, what's the starting like? point? Yeah, what's the starting point? Well, you have to start in the text, and I saturate myself in the text. Uh, I I memorize the main passage that I'm going to be preaching. Now, uh, now expand which, that expand that a little bit because. Some people think, oh, yeah, you, you get real familiar with it. No, Travis, if from what I know about Travis, he's actually memorizing whatever piece of Scripture he's preaching. Right? Is that yeah. correct, Travis? Yeah, that's what you just yeah. And so um, I preached the sermon one time on Revelation 4 and 5, and I memorized Revelation 4 and 5. And, in the, you know, as, as I'm preaching that sermon, I, I quote both of those chapters from memory. That's amazing. That's um, amazing. Yeah. And so, but, but what that does is, is you internalize that text. And so that, that's the first step I'll do. And so if I've got, if I'm preaching on a Sunday, I'll start on that Monday, I'll memorize the text. It may take a few hours. Um, but then throughout the rest of the week, I'm constantly coming back to that text. It's always on my mind. I'm always rolling it over in my head, thinking, okay, where does this break? And where are the points at? What's, what's the author trying to say? Um, and so that, 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 and that text just becomes a part of who I am. And so when I get into the pulpit, and I preach, I'm not just preaching a sermon, but I'm preaching a piece of who I am. Hmm. That's really um, good. It, yeah, it's really good. It, it's worked on my heart. It's worked on my life. And and I would say that if, if a passage of Scripture has not, if you have not meditated on it, studied it, read it, and applied it, to, to the point that your heart burns hot with passion over it, then you are not ready to get in the pulpit and preach that song. Hmm. So that's starting point. So you've saturated yourself. You're marinating in this text. You're probably allowing the Holy Spirit to guide your thinking in this. Um, yeah. Where do you go from here? What's kind of the? How do you take all that and then turn it into something you're going to share with people? Uh, I try to do, I typically, um, especially in a, in a, in a epistle or a prophet, something like that, I'll try to do some sort of uh, mechanical outline or a diagram or something like that where I'm, I'm looking at how, how are the phrases and the words of this passage fitting together. Um, 
And then from that, I'll develop a, a descriptive or a thematic outline uh, where I would say, hey, you know, Paul, Paul is telling Timothy that a pastor must have a desire to preach. And Paul is telling Timothy uh, that a pastor must uh, guard his family. He must protect the doctrine of the church, and he must possess these characteristics. Um, and at times, um, well, oh, let me. The next step then is to take that descriptive outline, and, and in the descriptive outline, I'll have um, under each point, I'll have an explanation of that point of of that passage, that part of the passage. Um, and then I, I move from the descriptive outline into an applicational outline. Um, I will develop a propositional statement, which is the overarching point of the passage um, that isn't descriptive, um, but is very imperative. It's what it's the so what of the sermon. And you can get up there and you can talk about a passage all day. But if you don't tell people why it matters, why it matters to them, why it matters to their life, then you're wasting your time. Yeah, we just didn't need another so, pastor that said the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Got to have this application piece. And and uh, yeah. as a, as a side point, me me and you, your PhD advisor was also my preaching professor, um, Doctor York at, at Southern, and uh, and he he was very big on. This thing with points, we've talked about this a little bit, but stating all your points applicationally, and I mean, and that's kind of what you're describing is how yeah. how that goes. Imperative, imperative point. And so, I think you said in the well, so what? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So of... what? Because we can we can do something really didactic, present a lot of information, and then you're left with that. Yeah, but so what? I don't care, right? I mean, what do I do with that? And if you don't leave people but, with that, you've missed it. And that's. That's one of the issues that I have with John MacArthur. Um, MacArthur says that, that you should never apply, you, you should never include an application in your sermon. Whoa. That and what's his reasoning be, on that? That it should be the role of the Holy Spirit to apply the text. But, and that as the preacher, you cannot know how that text applies to everyone in the congregation. But here's the problem. MacArthur doesn't abide by his own rules. <laughs> uh, you know, he preached like a, I want to say it was like a two-hour sermon on the Sunday after 9-11. You're not going to tell me that he stood up there and just, communicated information for two hours. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I sat under some of these firms, and they're, they're, they've got application in them. Uh, I, I understand what he's saying, uh, but I still think you've got to tell people why it matters. Well, I mean, so I but, we've used the Peter's sermon that starts in Acts chapter 2 as sort of a, a guide in some of this. And they go, oh, no, what do we do? At the end of this, here's the information. You've killed the Messiah. What do we do? Well, you need to turn to that Messiah, and he then gives them the application. So there's a biblical picture of here's some application. Uh, So I've developed the overarching proposition um, that each of my points link back to that proposition. So I'll take that descriptive outline I'll turn it into an application outline. And so instead of instead of saying Paul tells Timothy um, to that the pastor must, must possess a desire for the ministry, um, I'll say have a desire for ministry. Yeah. So, if, if you're gonna be if you're gonna be a pastor you know, be a pastor that honors God by desiring the position by guarding the family, by protecting the doctrine, and by possessing the characteristics or whatever. And so that's, that's the proposition, and then, you know, four applicational points. So I have a question uh, kind of for you personally. 
in the in the process. So as you're, we've been using the term kind of filling the bucket, just saturating information, mm-hmm. study, and then you have this this time where you now need to identify just the thimble's worth of what you can share based on all the stuff you've experienced, studied, and learned. Right. And then you're standing and delivering, and you're you're actually, you know presenting this message you've been working on and preparing, and then you sort of have the after-recovery time period. Of all of those, what's your most favorite part of the process and what's your least favorite part of the process? Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, probably my least favorite is mining and trying to find good, relevant, um, interesting illustrations for my point. You and Jared have a lot in common. Yeah, we we have a lot of common, Travis. This is I struggle yeah. at this place too. I, I it, could it, I could care less about illustrations. <laughs> well, it, it's not it's not even that I don't care about them because I understand their value. Yeah, me too. I understand their value. Um, and I understand you need them, but it's just hard to find them. <laughs> yeah. And, and I use I use Twitter. I use Twitter <laughs> on for illustration because uh, I follow a ton of people, and then I'll if I come across an article, a news article, um, or something like that, I'll I'll save it to Insta Paper. And then I've got a folder in my Insta paper that is simply labeled sermon illustration. So you can just kind of go through that. Yeah. So you can have real life, real life application illustration. Yeah. I, mean, I came, I guess it was, a, it was probably a year or two ago. I mean, I came across an article that, you know, South African man gets up and walks out of the morgue. Well, I'm like, What? And, and it was literally that. This man had been declared dead, put in a body bag, taken to the morgue, and was there in, in a cooler, and all of a sudden just wakes up and starts yelling. And everybody, you know, freaks out and thinks that there's a ghost. And, and they ended up finding out that this guy was in this body bag and been wrongly declared dead, had barely had a pulse, but ended up coming to and was alive. That's an interesting and, illustration right yeah. there. Yeah. I mean, that's, uh, so unfortunately, Travis, we're starting to run out of time, and there's kind of one thing we still absolutely need to land on. We need to we need to talk about that. Um, well, I, I was just going to say, before we jump into our last piece, um, so what's your, so your week, you do all this preparation, you preach. Um, what's kind of your emotional? Kind of give us just a quick view of your emotional kind of wavelength through the week. How do you how do you feel through this whole kind process? Of highs and lows. Yeah, highs and lows. Well, it's like what's Saturday night? Like for me, it's oh my sermon's terrible. You know, I've kind of hit that point. Well, if if I'm feeling like my sermon's terrible on Saturday night, then I'm in trouble. <laughs> so that's not a good time for yeah. you to have that. Yeah. Um, it's, I feel the weight of it. Um, I feel the weight that, that I, I am nervous every time I get into the pulpit. Not because I'm nervous and afraid to speak in front of people, but because I realize that I'm holding in my hand the eternal destiny of these people's souls. And I'm either going to point them to Christ or I'm going to point them away from Christ with what I say in the next 30 minutes to an hour. And so I feel the weight of that. And and I, I try to let that weight drive me to prayer. Um, and and then, then I preach. And then after I preach, I crash. It's just, there was a couple of weeks ago where I preached four times in one Sunday. And I didn't know, I didn't know my name by the end of the day. <laughs> it was just. I uh, think that's been the common consensus too. Yeah, I mean, it's just, people think, oh, you're just standing up there talking. Like, like people don't realize what 
normal going on in the mind of a preacher while he's preaching. Because it's, what, what have I already said? What am I saying right now? What am I getting ready to say? What do I need to edit out as I'm preaching? Um, yeah, it's hard you're thinking. Yeah, you're thinking about hand gestures, facial expressions, posture, eye contact, and all of these different things are going on um, in the midst of, of a sermon, and it's just mentally exhausting. Uh, but it's, it's something I love, and, and just, just briefly, each one of those applicational points that I develop, I have an explanation, an application, and an illustration for all. So, Travis, now being your friend, I know that I know that there is something also very special about you in in your preaching, um, which which was we've kind of saved here to the last. So, when you step up into the pulpit, you you don't have any notes, and why is that? Because I'm blind. He's blind. Yeah, he's blind. So. I'm blind. Um, I you have an additional hurdle to be working with that many people don't have. Well, and that's that's one reason why I've memorized my passage. Yeah. Uh, and, and there are some workarounds for that now, uh, now, but it's still something I would recommend for people to do. Um, and and it, it's, it's not as hard as it sounds um, because... You know, memorization is just like any other muscle. The more you do it, the more you realize how you do it, the better you can get at it. Um, but yeah, I lost my sight when I was 12. I uh, had a severe sinus infection uh, that kills most people that have it. Um, and I uh, came out of that, and God wasn't finished with me. God had a plan for my life. Um, graduated high school. I went to the University of Kentucky, graduated there, did my master's and PhD. And um, God has, has used my willingness, my story to uh, really reach out and impact people, people all over. Well, Travis, we really thank you for being, being with us. Um, and also, just as a side note, Travis... Travis, there's a movie about Travis's life back when you were wild and crazy in high school um, <laughs> called 23 Blast, which is kind of making its way out there and, and around the country, and um, people can look at, look that up on the Internet and learn a little bit more more about you. But I just want to I want to thank you. I mean, we, we had a great time in seminary as friends. You always, you, I mean, you are and still one of my, one of my best friends in ministry. Um, and so I appreciate you talking with us today. Yeah, I do too. Really appreciate you being our guest. It's my pleasure. Unfortunately, it's all the, the time we have for our podcast. We've kind of pushed our limit, and so uh, we're going to have to end it here. But uh, until next time. Thanks for listening. For more information, please visit www.saltybeliever.com. Mm-hmm.